today. Uh, I'm Teresa Strong, the Director of Research Programs at FPWR. I'm uh, very excited to tell you about our new research grant. I wanted to acknowledge Jessica Bahanowicz, who's the Associate Director of Research Programs, who spends a lot of her time uh, managing and keeping track of all our grants and grantees. Um, and always an opportunity to throw up a picture of the reason that I'm so passionate about PWS, which is Daniel, um, my son, shown at the top. Uh, shortly after his, he came home from the hospital. And at the bottom last year, after I think we hiked to see the largest cedar in the world in Olympic uh, National Park. So that was very exciting. Um, so I'm uh, excited today to tell you about our research. There we go, sorry. Um, and I'll start with FPWR's mission. So our mission is to eliminate the challenges of PWS through the advancement of research. And we do this by supporting a broad portfolio of high impact research. And we do this across the research spectrum. So from uh, real bench research and discovery all the way through to clinical care. And we do this um, in with in, in two ways, one through a directed research program in which we're identifying those areas that need uh, uh, support and are uh, we need to generate critical information or resources, and those are directly managed by our research team, which the whole team is shown on the right. And then what we'll focus on today is the grant program, which is are the uh, grants that come or proposals that come from experts in the field where they're bringing their best ideas to us. We review them and um, choose through a competitive grant process uh, the ones to support. So I'll encourage you to take a look at, on our website at FPWR's five-year research plan. I won't be going into depth in, uh, about it today, but we'll have a future webinar to go through it in some depth. Um, but we did take the time to uh, look at the landscape of PWS research and assess where FPWR can make the, the biggest impact. And as I said, we have directed research programs, which are shown in blue research tools and resources that can be used by many investigators, shown in green, and the grant program, which we'll focus on today. If we take those directed research programs and tools um, and, and show them across the research spectrum, all the way from discovery and drug development through drug evaluation and uh, uh, use in clinical care, um, you can see where some of those directed programs fit. Uh, and again, that will be the subject of another webinar uh, later on in the year. Today, we're going to focus on our grant program. And the purpose of our grant program is really to support the most innovative uh, research that we can, the exceptional opportunities. And these opportunities really come across the entire research spectrum. So rather than the targeted approach of our directed program, this is uh, just really looking for the best opportunities uh, for our research dollars. The goals of our investigator-initiated grant program are then to support early stage, highly innovative, sometimes higher risk but potentially higher reward research using a competitive program and we select the grants based on a collaborative input of scientists to review the scientific merit of each proposal and also we have parent advocate reviewers for each of the proposals and that's to ensure that the research that we're supporting is research that's important to our community um, we support research that aligns with our priorities uh, of advancing the understanding of PWS and developing more effective therapies uh, for our kids. And this program really, um, uh, one thing that it does is expand the base of our PWS researchers so it can draw scientists who have expertise, for example, in neurobiology or in psychiatry who have not done PWS research into the PWS field. It's also a mechanism whereby we can support promising young researchers who are just getting started out in their careers um, to you know, get, get their wings in PWS and hopefully stay there. Um, and it is also an opportunity to uh, support established researchers who might have some new ideas about how to address the challenges of PWS. So the accomplishments of our grant program since its inception, and the grant program has been running since FPWR uh, was established uh, in 2003. 
Um, we've invested more than $9 million in uh, PWS research, and that's supported more than 130 research projects in 13 countries. So a lot of research. And, uh, you know, one question that uh, is, is asked, and, and rightfully so, is, is what do we get from that, those investments? So the FPWR supported research to date has um, has uh, been uh, uh, described in more than 125 medical uh, publications. And this is really important. This is how scientists communicate with each other, how they communicate advances to each other, how they build on each other's research. So getting the publications and the kinds of journals that the projects are being published in are really important metrics for understanding the impact that uh, our, our dollars are having. And uh, as might be expected, reflecting the broad portfolio in our grant program, these publications have, uh, have really uh, come in many different areas. So there have been publications that are providing new insight into the function of the genes in the PWS region, a new understanding of appetite and appetite regulation in PWS, the uh, uh, identification of new targets for drug development, the advancement of some candidate drugs um, from the bench, and also some clinical uh, studies, both clinical trials and some um, uh, studies to improve clinical care in PWS. So really reflecting the, the entire spectrum of research in PWS. FPWR supported investigators, one of the reasons they use our grant program is to generate some data so that they can then get funding for larger studies from government agencies. And many of the investigators that we have supported have been successful in doing this. So it's really a way to leverage our investments. And there's also been many new resources, cell, cell lines, animal models, um, that have been developed by our investigators, which we then require and is, is it's what you're supposed to do anyway, uh, to be shared among the scientific community. So when those resources are made, they are shared with others so that um, we're not reinventing the wheel and being inefficient. And we've also uh, supported the development of some new drugs and targets and new insights into clinical care. This just gives you a profile of the research that we've supported through our grant program, the research category, about pretty evenly split between uh, really in the dish in vitro work, so, so strictly lab bench work, animal models, and then clinical studies, those are clinical trials or studies that involve uh, human participants or PWS uh, kids for clinical, uh, advancing clinical care. You can see the number of grants that we've uh, supported each year has really gone uh, steadily up. Uh, 2017, we're just showing the first half of the year. We expect another group of grants in the second half of the year. And you can see around 2013, we had a really nice jump in the number of grants we were able to support. Um, and it also reflects the number of proposals that we got. I think our first year in 2004, we had about 15 proposals submitted, and now on average we're getting uh, probably about 80 proposals per year submitted. So it really shows that the scientific community um, appreciates us as a reliable source of funding and is thinking about how they can do PWS research that fits with our goals. And the research areas that we've supported, you can see are broken down in this pie chart. It's really, again, across the board, many aspects of PWS that are important uh, to our children. And uh, this is obviously not meant for you to read, um, unless you'd like to, uh, but just shows you some of the publications that have come out in the, in the first uh, part of 2017 to date. These are all been supported by your funds. And if I highlight a few on the next slide, um, just to show you the, the kinds of things we're supporting. There's some really complex but really important genetics, understanding how the, the genes in the PWS region work. Uh, some straight up drug development from uh, Dr. Hoagland's group, developing uh, ghrelin inhibitors. Uh, some studies looking at the basis of autism and how it compares in PWS to other uh, causes of autism. Uh, imaging studies to look at how the, the brains of individuals with PWS uh, function and how, again how it compares among subgroups and uh, among typical uh, between typical individuals and finally uh, a study to that uh, identifies a new target for drug development excuse me 
So those are the kinds of studies that we're uh, supporting. Uh, it, uh, we try to put those on our blog. If you're signed up for our blog, hopefully you're getting some information on the individual studies as they come out. Um, I'll turn now to our new programs or projects that we're supporting in this round of funding. Um, so we have identified nine new grants to be supported, um, and they're shown in a list here, and I'll just be going um, through one by one to tell you a little bit about each of them. So we broke them down into general categories, the first of which is the development of new therapies for PWS. Uh, and there are two grants in this category. Uh, the first was funded in partnership with FPWR Canada and is from Mark Leland's group. And um, Dr. Leland is a longtime geneticist. Uh, he was actually one of the first people to describe the imprinting defect in PWS. So he has, uh, he has worked in PWS for a long time and he is interested in looking at ways to reactivate the PWS region gene. So we know all individuals with PWS have those genes present. Everybody has a maternal chromosome 15, whether they're, they're PWS by deletion or by uniparental disomy or imprinting. But those, those genes are silent. And Dr. Leland's group has been doing uh, a good bit of work trying to identify the machinery that silences those genes. And he is looking at uh, zinc finger 274, which is a particular uh, protein that is critical in silencing those genes. Um, and he is looking at ways to disrupt the, that protein and uh, unsilence the gene. So he's using state-of-the-art CRISPR technology um, to do that. And, and the advantage of this, we're, FPWR is actually supporting a few projects on gene activation in parallel because we're, each one has challenges and opportunities and, and we think it's important to be uh, advancing a few ways of trying to do this. This particular approach is important uh, potentially because it, it might be very specific for turning on only the PWS region genes and not other genes throughout the genome. We're excited about this grant because um, it is gene activation, it's genetic therapy, what's not to like about genetic therapy. Um, it's a very experienced research team and it builds on some of their previous work and resources that they have developed over the last couple of years. Um, some of the longer term or broader contributions are that really understanding that on-off switch on how we turn genes on and off in the PWS region is gonna be critical to any of our um, gene activation strategies. So it's, it's really a way of laying groundwork for either this approach or other approaches uh, for genetic therapy for PWS. And this group has been great about generating resources and methods that can be more widely used. Um, they're, they're big on uh, growing organoids in a dish, brain organs, so they can look at the uh, interaction between neurons. And all of that will be important for our research field as well. The second therapeutic grant that we're supporting is from um, Yossi Tam, um, who has uh, been looking at the endocannabinoid system in PWS. Um, so he did a study that was published late last year looking at the endocannabinoid system and found that it's, the whole system is a little off in PWS. It's overactive. And um, with investigators at the NIH, um, he has been looking at a drug um, to, uh, to target this system. And he showed last year in FPWR-supported work that this drug in a mouse model of PWS causes significant weight loss. So they're getting, they're, they're building the rationale to take this drug into clinical trials. And the first part of that is, you know, looking at how it affects weight. Um, so that was encouraging. This project is looking at additional uh, aspects of the endocannabinoid system in PWS. And Dr. Tam believes that um, the disrupted endocannabinoid system in PWS is also contributing to poor bone health, which is just highly prevalent in PWS. Um, and he's testing whether this drug, which we know causes weight loss in, that, in the mouse model, might also be effective in improving bone health. Um, so that's sort of a, a, a bonus aspect of the drug, but it will also be important in advancing it to uh, clinical studies. So we're excited about this grant because 
poor bone health is more than 90% of individuals with PWS have bad bone health, and we don't necessarily, it doesn't always hit the top priority on our, on our list, but it's really important if you're going to exercise and be active, you have to have strong bones, and having fractures and needing operations obviously is uh, detrimental to your overall health and your ability to uh, exercise. So um, the drugs, these drugs that they are already looking at uh, for weight loss might actually improve bone health as well. We also are, you know, think this is a great young investigator. He's got an excellent team. He's put together some great collaborators and that's encouraging to see. So the potential long-term contributions are we really don't understand why people with PWS have this poor bone health that's really consistent across the board. And so we might get at why, why that's happening. It can improve bone health and reduce the risk of fractures and breaks, which would be great, obviously. Um, and um, it may also be another feature of a drug uh, that can be evaluated in clinical trials. And that's, you know, anytime you can build rationale for testing a drug in people with PWS, uh, that's a benefit. So we're looking forward to uh, having this project completed and seeing this class of drugs move into, uh, hopefully, into PWS within the next uh, few years. So the next general category we have is how um, genetics might advance understanding and treatment of PWS, and there are three grants that fall into this category. Um, the first of which is one that if you were on social media generated quite a bit of interest because it's a really interesting finding that Dr. Godler um, has come up with. So FPWR is funding Dr. Godler, or funded him previously, and is actually funding him uh, now, to develop a newborn screening test for PWS. So he has, he's, he's really a technology guy. Um, he is uh, big on developing uh, cutting edge technology to, to do testing. And he's applied his technology to PWS as a way to screen babies when they're born so that we can get early diagnosis on everyone. Um, and so that's a very important project that's progressing very nicely. But as part of that project, he's using a technology that is really, really quantitative. And he noticed that um, some individuals with uniparental disomy seem to have some cells that actually had three chromosome 15s. So if you'll bear with me in genetics for a moment, we know that all individuals who have PWS by UPD actually start out at conception as having three chromosome 15s. Um, having three chromosome 15s is not compatible with development, so, so a baby can't develop with that chromosome complement, and so they lose the paternal chromosome, and that's how you get PWS. But apparently, in some individuals, not every cell has lost that extra chromosome. And so Dr. Godler found a percent of individuals with UPD, it's a small percent, and he's not sure of the numbers yet, that's the point of this project, um, who have um, some cells that apparently have three chromosome 15. So he's going to um, look at the uh, frequency of um, how often that happens, and also look at how that correlates with severity of symptoms in PWS. So we're excited about this uh, because it's a researcher with expertise in genetic testing. He's discovered a new phenomenon that may explain some of the variability. We don't know yet whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to have some trisomic cells. It might be good because in those cells you have paternal expression of the genes, presumably. Uh, it might be bad because in the cells with three chromosome 15s, they might not work as well. So, so it's, it's really not clear, but this should uh, allow us to gain some clarity on that, on that question. And um, he is working with, uh, with Dr. Butler, who's an experienced PWS clinician, to look at how clinical aspects correlate with uh, the genetics. And um, I think in the long term, this is going to give us answers to some questions about, you know, the spectrum of severity in PWS. Um, it supports the continued development of the newborn screen. And it's also a technology that can be used to monitor our gene activation programs. Um, so that will be an advantage of continuing to develop this technology as well. The second genetic uh, project, uh, many of you have sent baby teeth to Dr. Ryder. He uses those baby teeth to grow stem cells and develop neurons in a dish. And he's particularly interested in aspects of autism and in 
in PWS and in other chromosome 15 disorders like duplication 15. Um, and so he's developed a whole um, bank of um, stem cells from your kid's teeth uh, and is doing molecular analyses to compare this. Um, so we're uh, interested in this project because it is looking at the underlying basis of autism. So he's looking at individuals who have autism versus those who don't with PWS and comparing it to other groups that have autism. Um, it uh, allows um, a uh, uh, the baby teeth and using the baby teeth allows a lot of cell lines to be made. And this is an investigator who's very active, not only in PWS, but in Angelman syndrome and duplication 15 um, syndrome. So uh, an understanding of how PWS neurons uh, are different than typical neurons and how they differ between those who have autism. Sorry, we're having a tornado in the background. Hopefully I won't get blown away. Um, those who have uh, autism and those who don't. Um, may lead to an understanding of what is the molecular basis of that autism and also might uh, allow us to develop new targets for drug development. Um, keep sending this teeth to Dr. Ryder. You have to have the kit ahead of time, so please, if your child is um, about to lose some teeth, uh, go ahead and contact Dr. Ryder and he can send you a kit for that. The final um, grant in the genetics group is from Dr. Driscoll, uh, looking at how genetic factors and biological factors may affect how effective oxytocin is in PWS. So this is a study that's going to use the samples and the data from Dr. Miller and Driscoll's recent oxytocin trial in children with PWS. And they found that some kids are responding better than others and um, trying to figure out what is underlying that difference. So they'll be looking at um, the amount of active oxytocin levels in the blood. They'll be looking at genetic variants in the receptor, so how that oxytocin is received by the person, and examining the function of the proteins that are processing that oxytocin. And they're going to correlate that with the results of the study, really to try to get an individualized picture of how individuals with PWS respond and why. So this is a really uh, important grant, I think, because um, you know we know so far that the oxytocin trials in PWS have been generally positive, but they've been pretty variable. And one possible explanation is that different individuals have a different response because of their receptors or because of how they process the oxytocin. So this knowledge is really needed to better understand how to uh, optimize oxytocin therapy in PWS. And the potential long-term contributions are to really help uh, researchers uh, design clinical trials that are more uh, efficient and, and hopefully uh, more likely to succeed. And it could also guide the personalized uh, treatment of oxytocin in PWS in the long term. So we have two projects that are really addressing hyperphagia in PWS. One is developing biomarkers and another uh, looking at a therapeutic intervention. The first is Dr. Key at Vanderbilt University and she's developing, you know, for anyone who's been in PWS clinical trials, you know the, the way we, we most typically measure uh, that excessive appetite is by a questionnaire and questionnaires are never I mean, it can be a good measure, and it is, but we always want more objective measures, and so Dr. Key is going to look at that. So she's developing some techniques, an eye tracking technique, and uh, a way of measuring brain waves when individuals with PWS look at food, and um, that can be a much more quantitative measure of how interested a person is in food, and that might be very useful for our clinical trials that are up and coming. So. Um, you know, we, we want to get away from or complement the caregiver reporting on hyperphagia, which can be subjective and improve the quality of the clinical trial results. This is an approach that can be used across ages and intellectual ability. So even for individuals who don't communicate well or who are younger or don't have classic signs of hyperphagia, if they're more interested in food, it should show up in this test. And in the long term, it's really, I think, going to help us understand the onset of hyperphagia in PWS and also uh, can be a valuable endpoint for clinical studies. The second um, grant in this category is from Dr. Butler, and he's evaluating whether um, a non-invasive electrical brain stimulation can improve hyperphagia in PWS. 
So this is um, transcranial direct current stimulation, which is, um, you know, you just put an electrode on the, on the outside of the skull and give a very mild electrical stimulation. And um, many investigators are looking at this to treat things like depression and um, some OCD and other uh, psychiatric disorders. And Dr. Butler is looking at whether it can be used to um, reduce hyperphagia in PWS. So they're gonna um, do this uh, this treatment and then look at multiple measures of hyperphagia uh, in uh, people with PWS. And this is a, uh, an exciting grant because it has the potential to, uh, if it is positive, to, it's, a, it's known to be a safe intervention and it has the potential to be a, a adopted uh, fairly widely in the PWS community. Um, they're looking at multiple measures of hyperphagia. This is a group uh, that has a lot of experience with PWS research. So Dr. Butler is partnering with um, a Conmawak uh, group homes to do this study. So, um, you know, two great groups coming together um, and it's an excellent environment. So we like this because we like uh, all potential new therapies um, because it may also provide us with some new measures of efficacy um, and some insight into how hyperphagia develops. So our final two grants are really are looking at aspects of behavior and cognition and mental health in PWS, which is another really important area um, for our families. The first one is from Dr. Holland, um, who has a very long career in PWS research, has done so much in describing some of the um, mental health vulnerabilities for people with PWS. And a few years back, Dr. Holland started looking at vagus nerve stimulation because it was reported in typical obese people to reduce hunger and cause weight loss. Um, what he found, he did a, a small study, and unfortunately, they did not find weight loss. However, a couple of the participants um, expressed a real change in behavior, real improvement in behavior. Um, and so Dr. Holland has now designed a study to really look at that aspect of VNS. So they're gonna determine if this VNS therapy can decrease temper outbursts and improve the challenging behavior that is associated with PWS um, in mainly adolescents and adults. So again, this is a potential therapy that uh, could have a, uh, a reasonably quick course um, into uh, clinical acceptance if it proves to be uh, to have efficacy. Um, it is a, a potential therapy for uh, adolescents and adults with PWS, and it will address some of the biggest problems or challenges for families and the person with PWS, which includes those temper outbursts and some of the more difficult behaviors. Um, in addition, it really addresses, uh, there's a polyvagal theory um, for those aficionados who want to uh, look that up or I'm happy to discuss it a little bit more, um, of, of how that system is disrupted in PWS. So it's really gonna give us some insight into whether that hypothesis is correct or not. Um, and you know, really there's, there's a lot of need in the mental health area of PWS, so we're excited to see some potential um, new therapies in that area. And the final um, grant we'll discuss today is from Dr. Hoff at Mount Sinai, and he is an expert in neuroanatomy. He's one of those individuals um, who is out, has been outside of the PWS area, but he's been studying the neuroanatomy of autism. And so it'll be a great perspective, I think, to bring to the PWS world. Um, and he's studying this particular set of neurons, these von Economo neurons, that are really critical for social function. And they're, um, they're not present in lower animals and in, in mice and, and you know, rats and things, um, but they're present in primates and humans, and they're really important for those social interactions, sensory awareness, and problem solving. And he's seen some disruptions in individuals with autism, and now we'll be looking at it in PWS. So he'll be characterizing the, the brain structures and looking at differences in PWS compared to other autism individuals and uh, compared to typical individuals. So um, this is important because, you know, we really don't have a lot of studies that are looking at the neuroanatomy in PWS, and this is an expert in that field, and looking at this particular set of neurons that seems to be critical to some of the social function of our kids. 
um, and uh, it brings an expert in that field into PWS research. And I think we really uh, would benefit from additional expertise in neuroanatomy and neurobiology in PWS. And it could suggest uh, new approaches for addressing this, uh, the socialization problems in PWS. So those, that's a very quick run through of all of our grants. Um, just what else to expect in 2017? You know, we're continuing with our grant program. It continues to be very robust. We're currently um, evaluating more than 20 research projects. Um, that will be announced in the fall. So we, we keep having excellent interest from the research community. We're going to continue uh, progress advancing our basic understanding of PWS and finding new targets, developing the early stage drugs. We're going to see in, uh, in 2017, maybe bleeding into 2018 a little bit, the outcomes of several clinical studies that will be of a lot of interest to our community on oxytocin, carbitocin, uh, rhythm study on set melanotide. The results from that should be available uh, later in the summer or in the fall. Dr. Scheiman's diet study looking at a low carb diet and how it affects hunger and behavior. The, uh, the VNS study, Dr. Holland's study. Um, so all of those should be coming out and you know some of them will probably work. Some of them probably will not work. All of the information will be important for us to just, you know, to look ahead and, um, you know, hone or guide us in trying to figure out what are going to be the best therapies for our kids. We're also going to see the start of a number of new clinical studies, diazoxide, CBD oil, um, oxytocin and carbitocin, Alizé's drug, uh, mindfulness intervention. All of these are set to start in the next six months to a year. So the, there's a lot of clinical studies going on, which is really so encouraging for us. Um, we're going to have expanded use of the global registry. You'll see us pushing for you um, very soon to go back in if you already have a record and update your record. If you haven't registered uh, for the global registry, we will be encouraging you. That's one of our strongest tools as, as a community to advance the clinical research. FPWR is going to continue um, engaging in the rare disease community um, and uh, leading the way as an advocacy group. We'll have some uh, additional web webinars this year on uh, the caregiver burden in PWS, the directed research programs, the registry, so keep your eyes out for that. And we hope to see you uh, in Indianapolis this August for the FPWR annual uh, family conference, which we're really looking forward to. Um, I'd like to end with a just this is a, a list of the clinical trials that are ongoing or are planned for coming up. That's just kind of for your record to, to um, keep an eye on all of those and we'll let you know as results come out or additional studies start. So sign up for a clinical trials alert and we'll keep you up to date on that. So finally, thank you. None of this would be possible without our supporters and those of you who work so hard to, um, you know, bring financial uh, stability to PWS and allow us to go out and find the best research that we can to um, help our kids. I encourage you to stay up to date, uh, visit our website for the funded projects. We also, as outcomes come out, as papers come out, we put that on our website. You can um, uh, sign up for our blog to keep up with um, the outcomes as they come out and check out the, the five-year plan as I mentioned and thank you again to all of you who support us as individuals and all of the organizations that support our research program and so uh, that is all I have for today Susan I don't know if we have any questions uh, please feel free